I'm delighted to welcome Richard Koo, who's Chief Economist for Numura Research Institute. Richard's written a book recently, he's written many books, but this one is The Escape from Balance Sheet Recession and the QE Trap. So we'll be talking about that and um, many other topics. So welcome, Richard. Thank you. Um, I'll start off just asking about um, the concept of a balance sheet recession, yes. which is um, a term that you've coined. Um, if you think about Japan in the 1990s, how do you interpret what happened in Japan in, in, in the run-up to the crisis and, and in the aftermath of the crisis? Well, a run-up to the crisis, of course, was a huge bubble, a massive bubble, and a little <coughs> uh, piece of real estate in the middle of Tokyo was worth the entire state of California. And once the bubble burst, what happened? The asset prices collapsed, but all the liabilities people incurred over the years remained. And during the bubble days, people typically leverage themselves up. So there's a huge increase in liabilities. But as long as asset prices are higher than that, no one worries about this problem. But once the asset prices collapse, people realize that they have a debt overhang. And if you're technically bankrupt as a result, what do you have to do? Well, you have to bring your debt levels down. Now, that's the right thing to do at the individual levels. But when everybody does it all at the same time, we enter a massive fallacy of composition problems in that in the national economy, if someone is saving money, you better have someone borrowing money on the other side to make sure that all the saved funds are borrowed and spent. And in the usual world, in the textbook world, it's people like you and I in the financial sector taking the money from the savers, giving to someone who can use it. And if there are too many borrowers, interest rates are raised. Too few borrowers, interest rates are lowered to make sure that this cycle is maintained. But once every several decades, when private sector goes crazy about the bubble and the once the, then the, the bubble bursts, these people won't borrow money at any interest rates because their balance sheets are so deeply underwater. Mm. And so all these people are saving money. The money comes into the financial sector, but there's no borrowers on this side because all these people are repairing balance sheets. Mm. And when you enter that world, all the saved funds cannot re-enter the income stream. That becomes a deflationary gap of the economy. And that's when the balance sheet recession starts. Economic theory doesn't really um account for this. It, the, the idea is that an idea would, the, the idea being that someone would, um, would be reducing debt rather than maximizing profits right. is something which models suggest shouldn't happen. Well, so after I came up with this theory, hmm. the, what I found out was that basically what we were all taught in universities about economics were based on one key assumption. Mm -hmm. And that assumption is that these people don't have balance sheet problems. Mm -hmm. That their balance sheets are healthy, they can take risks, uh, they have plenty of uh, or credit worthiness that they can bank on. But once every several decades when the bubble bursts, they don't have that anymore. The balance sheet's underwater, the credit rating goes down uh, very sharply, and then people have to repair that first before they can go back to the textbook world. And when you've got the private sector that's, that's aggressively deleveraging, then the, the only solution really is for the government to step in and, and fill that gap. Uh, typically, we were taught that there's a monetary policy and a fiscal policy to deal with these issues. And monetary policy meaning bringing interest rates down and so forth. But when people have balance sheets underwater, you bring interest rates down to zero, these bankrupt people are not going to borrow money. And there won't be many lenders either. If the lenders knew that the borrowers are underwater, lenders cannot lend money to the borrowers also. And often, even lenders themselves have balance sheet problems mm -hmm. after the bursting of the bubble. Mm -hmm. So monetary policy is largely dead in the water. Mm -hmm. uh, central bank and all the reserves in the banking system through the QE but for the QE to actually enter the real economy, the financial institutions that got the reserves from the, from the central bank must lend this money. They cannot give away money after these are deposited as money. And if there are no borrowers, the money ends up just sitting in the banking system. So in, that, <coughs> in this very rare occasion, what's really missing is the borrower. If you look at the US after the crisis, then you know, the U.S. ran very large deficits, and those right. deficits, you know, they have reduced over time, but the U.S. is still running a large deficit. So, yeah, as you say, there were, there were much in the way of political pushbacks against the idea of running deficits, but, but you think that some of the policies run in the U.S. Were, were, were actually good policies. I'm happy to tell you that within the first year of the Lehman crisis, most of the key policymakers in the United States understood that this is balance sheet recession, and as a result, they came up with this uh, line, fiscal cliff. Fiscal cliff meaning that if you cut fiscal deficit too quickly, we will all fall off the fiscal cliff. And that warning kept U.S. Congress and others from cutting the deficits too quickly. I mean, the United States came mighty close to falling off the fiscal cliff on at least three occasions. 
the, the debt ceiling debate, the sequester, and the government shutdown, but it barely managed to stay away. Now, if you stay away from the fiscal cliff, that means the government is still borrowing and spending money. That gives income to the private sector. The private sector has the income to pay down debt. And every day, because private sector is deleveraging, every day their balance sheets are becoming cleaner, better. In the last two years, some Americans are beginning to borrow money. Yeah, because yeah. after four years of deleveraging, some of them feel comfortable enough with, with taking on debt. Which makes you think that looking at the US, therefore, that uh, the obsession in markets is when will the Federal Reserve start hiking interest rates? Um, and, or, or what should they do with the fiscal deficit now? But if, if the private sector is starting to, to borrow again, then you'd argue that they are escaping this balance sheet recession. The U.S. is a much healthier place. Yes, yes. What the U.S. tried to avoid with this whole term uh, fiscal cliff is what happened to Japan in 1997. After seven years, uh, uh, by then Prime Minister Hashimoto was listening to IMF, OECD, those very uh, orthodox people, and they start telling the Japanese government that, hey, you're building bridges to nowhere, roads to nowhere, the economy going nowhere, you have an aging population, cut the deficit. And I was already advising Prime Minister at the time and said, no, 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 you don't cut now. If you cut, the whole thing will come crashing down. But I'm just a non-private sector economist, not even Japanese. All these other big shots from around the world said, cut, cut, cut. So he did. We raised taxes, cut spending. We had five consecutive quarters of negative growth, complete breakdown in the banking system. The budget deficit, in spite of higher taxes and lower spending, increased more than 70%. And it took Japan 10 years to bring this thing back down to where it was in 1996, before the uh, fiscal consolidation took place. And Americans understood that and said, we're not going to make that mistake. And that's this whole eff emphasis on fiscal cliff. And they managed, the United States really the only country that truly avoided the fiscal uh, double dip. And as a result, they are doing much better. And that's a major contrast to the Eurozone, of course, where the policies have been, been the opposite. Um, you had um, arguably not much in the way of stimulus mm -hmm. um, monetarily, but fiscal stimulus, uh, there wasn't really a lot at all. There was great austerity in the Eurozone. So you know, this week, we've seen the beginning of QE um, from the ECB. Do you, um, I think I know what the answer is going to be, but do you think there's, there's much hope for, for QE being effective in um, boosting the Eurozone economy, or is there much more they need to do? Well, it's, QE is a very sad byproduct mm -hmm. of balance sheet recession, in my view. Because if it were not a balance sheet recession, it's ordinary recession and just some built up in inventories of a business cycle. If you bring interest rates low enough, someone will start responding and the economy will recover. Mm -hmm. But in the balance sheet recession, you bring rates down, down, still nothing happens, and you em en eventually end up with zero. Mm -hmm. Then people start saying, if the price doesn't work, let's try the quantity. And that's where the QE comes in. Mm -hmm. But if the key problem is lack of borrowers, you bring rates down to zero and pump all the reserves in the banking system, still should not produce that much results. And so every time QE is put in place, first in the US and UK, then Japan, and then uh, Eurozone now, exchange, foreign exchange market, for example, the exchange rates comes down, and based on that, some of the share prices go up. I don't think there's any reason why those responses should, should take place, because if you look at how much money is actually available to the private sector after and before QE, it's not much difference. But people kind of assume that with all that liquidity, money must be available to the private sector. And if there's more dollars against J Japanese yen, the dollar should depreciate. Or more Japanese yen against the British pound, then the Japanese yen should depreciate. They, they think that, that way. And that's why we get these market reactions. If the market is willing to move, and if you're a central banker, of course, well, if they're willing to believe in something that cannot be believed, well, by all means, use it. So within the Eurozone, do you buy into the idea that the problems are inherently structural or that you know, there are still great balance sheet issues within the Eurozone? Well, I will argue that the problem is probably 90% balance sheets, maybe 10% structural. But structural issues have been discussed in economic li literatures before. Margaret Thatcher, Ro Ronald Reagan, and US-Japan Structural Impediments Initiatives. But balance sheet issues were never discussed in economics until very, very recently. So most people, when they see a situation economy not responding to ordinary monetary policies, they say, oh, it must be structural. 
but it could be structural, it could be balance sheet problems. And these two are completely different animals, and they are no substitute for the other. And Japan made the same mistake in 1997, when IMF, OECD told Japan to cut, uh, cut the deficit, Prime Minister Hashimoto said, well, we're going to do a lot of structural reform to offset the negatives coming from fiscal consolidation. Didn't work at all. Japan had five quarters of negative growth, complete breakdown in the banking system, as I explained to you earlier. Europe hasn't learned that yet. So they're still thinking that by doing a lot of structural reform, they can offset the negatives from the austerity. But structural reform is like uh, treating diabetes. You do a lot of exercise, you become lean and mean, and then your health gets better. Whereas balance sheet recession is like pneumonia. If you don't treat the patient very well in the first three days, the patient is dead. Now, you can have both at the same time, and both do happen at the same time. But if you're faced with these two problems, which one do you treat first? You treat pneumonia, not structural uh, diabetes, because diabetes, you can wait a little bit. Pneumonia, you have no time. When the deflationary spiral happens, you have to act very quickly. You hear no word of structural reform from the United States, because all the policymakers, at least in the Obama administration, understood that this is a balance sheet problem, not a structural problem. That's why they insisted on maintaining fiscal stimulus, not fall off in a fiscal cliff. But there's not a single European leader who said, let's not fall off a fiscal cliff, even though European private sectors are all saving massive amounts of money. Irish private sectors are saving over 11% of GDP at zero interest rates. Uh, Portuguese private sector saving over 7% of GDP, nearly 7% of GDP at zero interest rates. And so they are all in massive balance sheet recessions but the treatment that are prescribed to them are all on the structural side, and so the situation just gets worse and worse and worse. So m many of these topics you touched on in your book in, in much greater detail. We could talk for, for hours, of course, but, um, but I do recommend that if you, if you want to read more about any of the points that Richard has raised, then these are expanded and greatly uh, within the book. So Richard, thank you very much for coming oh, in. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for this.